Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. Sorry for the delay. Uh, today we have with us uh, Himala Karaju from uh, Harvard, and she will talk to us about um, AI human uh, decision making. Uh, if you want to ask any questions, please use the Q and A tool, and I, I will um, we will uh, deliver those questions to Hima. Uh, why don't you take it away? Hey, awesome. Uh, thanks, everyone. Sorry again about the delay. Uh, I think somehow it ended up being that I got scheduled on a day where I'm at a conference and then giving a couple of talks there. And so the schedule has been a bit messy. Uh, but uh, glad to be here with all of you. And thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, today, I'm going to sort of give somewhat of a broad overview of, uh, you know, bulk of my recent research. Uh, so you know, we'll, we'll kind of start with this broad question of like, does model understanding improve human decision making, right? And what does it mean when we say model understanding? I'm going to sort of walk you all through, uh, you know, the beats of like what exactly I'm referring to when I say model understanding and so on, right? Okay, so the agenda for today will be uh, a couple of, uh, in a couple of ways. So one is I'll just give a brief overview of what we mean when we talk about understanding machine learning models as of today. Again, right, we are using some of these terms a bit loosely, so I'm going to discuss more about that. Um, now, uh, the second part of the talk will be about some of our recent work, which will basically think about how can model understanding help real world decision making, right? Uh, so for instance, we can, uh, we'll be looking at the counterfactual explanations for algorithmic recourse, and we'll be looking at feature attribution based explanations for early detection of diseases and resume screening. Okay, so I'll talk a lot about all of these pieces, but essentially let's go over some of the beats of what exactly I mean when I say understanding machine learning models, okay? Um, so as we all know today, machine learning is pretty much everywhere, right? So it's being used in healthcare, it's being used in finance, and uh, you know our favorite online apps, whether it is Facebook or Amazon or Goodreads, all of these essentially employ uh, machine learning to do different kinds of tasks, ranging from friend recommendation to uh, book recommendations to product recommendations to even disease diagnosis, treatment recommendations, and uh, you know deciding if somebody should get a loan and so on, right? So basically. Uh, machine learning is everywhere today. And I'm going to start with a little bit of a hypothesis, and then I'm going to walk you through examples. And hopefully, as we go through this talk, I can convince you a bit more that there might be some promise uh, in terms of, you know, employing or thinking about model understanding as a way to something tangible, right? It can actually potentially have a positive impact. But let's start with some examples of motivating scenarios, right? Uh, so, for instance, model understanding is can be very critical in domains, particularly those which involve high stakes decisions. So, for example, healthcare and finance and so on. Right? I'm just going to run us through a couple of examples just to see what are the different use cases where this might be helpful. Right. So, for instance, let's say that there is a predictive model which is ingesting images of animals and then it is predicting what animal is there in the image that it has just seen. Right. If a developer is developing this kind of a model and if he looks at this example, uh, then essentially the developer sees that the model is making the right prediction. That is, it's saying that the animal is Siberian Husky, which it is, so all seems good. But if we probe a little bit more closely, uh, so there is this sort of, if we look at what might the model be leveraging or focusing on, in some sense, what you see is like, it might be picking up on cues of snow in this particular image, right? So for instance, you know, the model might be focusing on these aspects, which is essentially snow in the images. And in which case the developer will realize that, well, what I've built is essentially a snow detector and it's not really a Siberian Husky detector, right? So maybe I need to debug this model a bit more and really sort of understand why it is just looking at snow in order to make these predictions. So in some sense, model understanding can help us with debugging. Okay, uh, Let's look at some of the scenarios that are in other domains. For example, this is a task where there is a predictive model making decisions about if an applicant should be uh, approved for a loan or not. Right? It ingests details about applicants and then makes a prediction of whether the loan is denied or accepted. In this case, unfortunately, the loan is denied. Instead of telling the loan officer that, oh, uh, you know, sorry, this person's loan is denied and not giving any more information, if we also tell the loan officer that here is 
here are some of the features the model is focusing on. For example, maybe it's looking at features like race and gender, which should not be looked at when making this decision. Then the loan officer can decide to discard the model's prediction and just go ahead and make his or her own decision, right? Uh, uh, so in this case, model understanding is facilitating bias detection. Now, if we look at the other side of this picture, where the same task, but we are looking at it from the perspective of a loan applicant, who instead of just being told that their loan application has been denied without being told anything more or given any further information, if we tell them a bit more, for example, if we say increase your salary by 50K and pay your credit card bills on time for the next three months to get a loan, in that case, the applicant has more information to sort of act upon this decision and actually you know, reapply for a loan after fixing some of these aspects of their profile, right? So in this case, model understanding is helping us provide recourse to individuals who are adversely affected by model predictions, okay? And of course, we can think of other use cases where, you know, instead of just telling doctors about the predictions the model is making, we can also give them more insight into what the model might be doing. For example, some patterns, right? So for instance, if gender is female, uh, then the model might have a pattern of like where ID numbers are greater than zero, it's assigning a label of sick to those people. But for gender female, it's looking at symptoms like cold and cough and then deeming somebody to be sick. So in this case, the model is using relevant features when making predictions on men, but that's not the case when making predictions on women, right? Uh, in this case, model understanding is helping the doctor determine if and when to trust these predictions when making decisions. Right, And in the similar way, it can also help regulatory authorities decide if a model is actually ready for deployment. Okay, So in some sense, model understanding allows us to vet models to determine if they're suitable for deployment in the real world. Okay. So there is a lot of utility uh, as evidenced by the use cases I just walked us through. For instance, it can be helpful to understand what features the model might be looking at in the context of debugging, bias detection, recourse, uh, to decide if and when to trust model predictions and also wet models to assess their suitability for deployment, right? And in enabling these use cases, model understanding can be helpful to end users, decision makers, regulatory agencies, researchers, and engineers, right? So achieving model understanding, how do we do that? Now that we have seen some examples of where model understanding can be potentially useful, how do we think about achieving it? One approach is to essentially build models that are inherently interpretable. For example, models like linear regressions or logistic regressions or shallow decision trees or you know, a short set of rules and so on. These are models that we can look at and kind of understand what is the decision-making process of the model. Uh, and you know, we can essentially like look at these models and see how it's sort of combining variables and like making a prediction, right? So again, while it's debatable whether these are actually interpretable, right? So I think it's 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 kind of a little bit of an accepted uh, piece by now in literature that these models, at least we can make some sense of what they might be doing, right? Now, the other approach that has become pretty popular in the last few years is explaining pre-built models in a post hoc manner. What do I mean by that is we might have a very complex model like a deep neural network uh, and we can pass such a model through an explainer algorithm and we can break that down into simpler models that we can make some sense of, right? So for instance, take a huge deep net with like, you know, tons of intermediate layers and we can potentially break it down into a bunch of simple linear models, right? And then that is at least more understandable for us in terms of like, you know, thinking about which uh, linear model is being activated for which prediction and so on. So two approaches, either build models that are inherently interpretable or explain previously built complex models in a post hoc fashion. Okay. Um, and now the question that comes up is like where to use which one, right? So should we go for inherently interpretable models or should we go for post hoc explanations? The answer to this question lies in some of the recent research which actually demonstrated that uh, there could be trade-offs between interpretability and accuracy. 
especially when your data sets have high dimensional features, for example, images or, you know, text and these kinds of data set, or if the data sets are large, like maybe you have billions of data points to deal with, right, like genomics data sets and so on. So in such cases where we are dealing with complex data sets, we are often observing in terms of empirical results that uh, models like linear regression and decision trees are often uh, interpretable to us, but they're actually not as accurate as more complex models such as random forests and neural nets, right? So it's turning out to be a trade-off really between interpretability and accuracy. And given that, people have started going for the second option of build a model as complex and as accurate you want, and then you can use post hoc explanation methods to try and explain what might be happening, right? Uh, now, when- Emma, I have a clarifying question, if I may. So uh, should we think of uh, interpretability or model understanding as, you know, ultimately I want to map these things into observables, uh, or uh, if we take, you know, embedding out of a complex model and just look at the shape of the embedding, would yeah. you call that interpretability as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I think part of the thing that is both exciting, but also sort of a little bit imprecise is I think we use the words interpretable and explainable to refer to a broad umbrella of things. And I'm going to give some examples of the different interpretations of what the interpretation is or the explanation is, right, uh, in just a bit. But I I'll get to that and you'll have a clearer idea, right? But essentially, all of this is just operating on observables, by the way. We are not considering any observables. A lot of this is also not causal in any way. So it's correlational and we are focusing on observability. Okay, so those are the two pieces. All right. Um, okay, so inherently interpretable models versus post hoc explanations, right? So when can we just get away with building models that are inherently interpretable uh, and they're also accurate? So for example, let's consider a case where we just have a very simple data set. So there's a two dimensional data set. I have a scatter plot of that data set here and blue represents one class label, like maybe a negative label and red represents a positive label, right? Uh, as you can see, you can almost sort of fit a line between these two classes and separate them. So they're almost separable in that sense, right? Um, so in this case, we'll be able to actually fit a linear model, which is interpretable as per the conventions that we are talking about. And also it is accurate because the data itself is such that it is almost linearly separable, right? So in this case, you can fit a simpler model and that will also be accurate. But oftentimes, your data's decision boundaries look something like this. As you can see, these are like highly nonlinear, and these are essentially like, you know, super nonlinear like this. And you can't, you know, again, thinking about linearity as one way of enabling us to easily understand something, uh, we can't really fit one linear model to sort of capture this entire boundary between the two classes, right? So in this case, we'll run into the trade-offs between accuracy and interpretability, and complex models might achieve higher accuracy, right? So that's that's like what we are running into, which means there'll be a trade-off. You need to either choose a model that's accurate or you need to choose a model that's interpretable, right? So in that cases, we can resort to using post hoc explanations. And sometimes you just don't even have enough data to build your model from scratch. All you have is just this proprietary black box, right? In that case, you don't even you have no option of building an inherently interpretable model you just have to deal with this black box in which case also post hoc explanations can come to the rescue right so the bottom line is if you can build a model that's inherently interpretable which is also accurate for your setting you should just do it otherwise post hoc explanations can come to your rescue okay and from here on i'll be discussing some of our work on post hoc explanations okay so what is an explanation Right. So an explanation can be thought of as some sort of an interpretable description of model behavior. And I'll again just talk about what these words mean in just a bit by showing some examples. Uh, so, for instance, let's say that there's a classifier and then there is a user. In some sense, an explanation acts as a bridge between these two. So the explanation in some sense needs to capture the behavior of the underlying classifier in a faithful and correct manner. And it also needs to capture the behavior, or rather, it needs to convey this information uh, to a user in an understandable manner, 
right? So that's essentially what we are sort of thinking about when we think of an explanation. So it should be faithful to the underlying model or it should correctly capture the behavior of the underlying model and it should be easier for a user to understand, right? And there are several ways to think about what could be such an explanation depending on who your user is. For instance, you can say, I'm sending all my model parameters to the end user, but that may not work if your end user is a doctor or a policy person. Those only work if your user is probably the the person who developed the model or an ML researcher or an engineer, right? Or you could just send a bunch of example predictions and then say, here are some example predictions the model is making. Hopefully that gives you enough idea about what the model is doing, right? Or you could summarize model behaviors with some sort of rules where, you know, these capture what the model might be doing. Or you could select some most important features the model might be using, or even data points that it is sort of like leveraging, and then convey those as explanations. Or you could just describe what you need to change in a particular data point in order to flip the model's prediction, and that could also be a description, right? So all these are, in some sense, different notions of what an explanation could be, and they have all been explored in literature, okay? So at a very high level, explanations can be thought of as local versus global explanations. And as the name suggests, local means you're focusing on explaining individual prediction and global means you're focusing on explaining a complete behavior of a particular model, right? In some bird's eye view sort of a way. Okay, uh, a lot of this talk will focus on local post hoc explanations. Uh, and again, I'll talk through those as we get to different pieces of like what those explanations could be, right? So I'm going to start our discussion with this uh, specific area, which is super exciting, called counterfactual explanations for algorithmic recourse, right? Uh, again, going back to one of our motivating examples, let's say that there is an applicant who sent his application to a bank, which has a predictive model, and the bank essentially takes this application and then predicts uh, the predictive model of the bank essentially takes this application and predicts that this applicant should be denied a loan, right? Instead of just leaving it at that, if we actually come up with a recourse for that person, for instance, increase or change your salary by increasing it by 50K and pay your credit card bills on time for next three months. So if we say what needs to be changed in that person's profile to get a loan, then that's useful. And that's exactly what is done by something called as counterfactual explanation, right? What do you need to change in a given data point in order to flip the model's prediction? Okay, and that is the words counterfactual explanations and algorithmic recourse are often used quite interchangeably in the literature because they're essentially referring to what do you need to change in a data point or an individual's profile in order to flip a prediction. Okay, now what's the generic intuition behind approaches that try to generate these kinds of explanations or algorithmic recourse, the generic intuition is that, let's say here is a point X, which is on the negative side of the model's decision boundary, which means it will get a negative class label. And then this point X, you can sort of nudge it around a bit or like keep adding or keep pushing it in a particular direction until you cross the boundary. And then you find a point that is closest to X, but also on the positive side of the decision boundary. Right. So that is essentially, you know, it could be either CF1, which is one option, or it could be CF2. Right. So that's essentially what a lot of these algorithms do, but they differ on how to choose among candidate counterfactuals. For example, a valid point or a valid change from X to CF1 that flips the label uh, is either this path or you can go from X to CF2, still flips the label, but it's a different counterfactual and it's a different path, right? So how to choose, and there are pretty much like any point across this boundary can be thought of as a counterfactual because it will enable you to flip that model's prediction on the point. So the proposed algorithms uh, differ on how to choose among these candidates. For example, some algorithms might say, let's pick a counterfactual that is closest in terms of L1 or L2 distance metrics. Other algorithms might say, let's pick a counterfactual that's actually on the data manifold. For example, if this is the data manifold or the data distribution ascension, right? And the second thing they differ on is how much access is needed to the underlying predictive model, which is, uh, should this algorithm see the complete model or can it assume the model is just a black box and it can spit out predictions to a given point and it does not need to know anything beyond, right? So there are several ways to solve this problem, okay? And uh, I've just discussed some of these strategies. So 
we did some recent work, which was basically we went out and kind of surveyed a, a bunch of loan applicants about how useful these kinds of explanations are. Uh, so more broadly, the survey that we did was with 182 bank customers who have applied for loans in the past year, and 56% of them have successfully obtained loans, remaining were either denied loans or asked very high interest rates, which they could not afford, right? So we conducted an online uh, survey asking these applicants about both the utility and the helpfulness of these recourses, quote unquote, right? Uh, and essentially, we had some very interesting answers. I'm going to show the questions now and then I'm going to talk through the answers, right? So some of the survey questions that we asked were, how helpful is a recourse that is prescribed in this format, which is, you know, change your salary to be something else or, you know, change your credit card score to be something else and you get a loan, right? So how helpful is that kind of uh, recourse or an explanation prescription? Or would such a recourse motivate you to change your circumstances and reapply for the same loan with the same bank? Again, we asked the question. Uh, answer is in the form of Likert scales for all of these. Then how would you feel if you implement the recourse and the bank still denies you the loan? Would you still do business with the same bank if this happens, right? So we ask these kinds of questions to uh, these participants and their an answers are super interesting. And of course, the last one is, would you expect the bank to give you a loan even if you fall slightly short of the prescribed recourse? Uh, so I'm going to show the answers to these questions now. So an overwhelming majority of 93% of these participants said that a counterfactual explanation prescribed as a recourse would be extremely helpful. Uh, and 76% of them agreed or strongly agreed that such a recourse would motivate them to act on it. And 81% of them were unsuccessful uh, applicants. And an overwhelming 98% of the total participants said that they would be very dissatisfied or dissatisfied if the bank denies a loan after they implement a recourse. Okay? And 83% of the participants said that they would never do business with the bank again. Right. So that's a pretty, uh, you know, important insight, because essentially, once the banks start handing out these kinds of recourses, there is no way they can go back. Right. So, for example, if you give somebody a recourse today and they come back next year after implementing it and you say, sorry, for whatever reason, things have changed. This is not going to work. That's a pretty bad scenario. Banks are going to lose business and customers. Right. Um, and 95% of the participants also agreed or strongly agreed that the bank should give them a loan, even if they fall slightly short of the prescribed recourse. So, for example, if they were asked to increase their salary by 10,000, and if they did that by 9,990, they still expect that they should get a recourse because it's like pretty close to what was asked in the first place, right? Those are the expectations from the customers who these model explanations or banks are trying to serve. Okay, um, we were very intrigued first by this question, because this essentially means once a bank gives a recourse, they can't go back on their promise, right? While there could be several reasons why that could happen, uh, we started exploring more of the computational aspects of it. Is there a time where because of your model or training or all of those, because of those aspects, you might run into a scenario where you the bank will not be able to honor its promise, okay? So, in fact, that is a challenge with some of the existing recourse algorithms, which is that the recourse generated is typically not valid when the underlying model changes, right? So in some sense, a lot of these algorithms kind of spit out recourses, assuming that the underlying model is not going to change. But we all know that the reality is that models, whether it be bank or any other organizations, they get regularly updated by practice partly to handle things like data shift or retraining and you know audits may also change uh, lead to changes in the model right so banks don't want an accurate model so they almost periodically or every month or so they keep updating these models so that they're very accurate so given that we have a problem because today you are giving somebody a recourse next month you are updating the model and then that recourse is no longer valid and this person is just kind of working on it right uh, so that's a problem so how to avoid that 
in order to avoid that, or, or rather at least address part of this challenge, we essentially uh, came up with a new optimization problem and also ways to solve it. In some sense, what we said was traditionally a lot of these recourse algorithms were saying, you know, find for a given point X, find a point X prime that is closest to X, but also flips the label of this one model M that we have from zero to one. Right. So what we are saying is instead of doing that just with respect to one model, we now have to do it with multiple possible models, which are all some increments or decrements of model M. Right. So let's say we have one logistic regression model. What we are saying is don't just find a recourse that works with this one model find a recourse that sort of works with some you know increments and decrements of this model right so if you add a plus or minus epsilon to the weights of this linear regression this recourse should still be valid or it should give a one label for such models as well right uh, that's how we were characterizing the changes in the model or the model shifts and essentially we formulated this as the sort of a minimax optimization problem so it has a minimization and there is an internal maximization where we try to minimize the worst case recourse loss under uh, a given possible set of shifts right so essentially, we used something called as adversarial training, which is a pretty popular way of thinking about solving optimization problems in an area called adversarial machine learning. But I'm going to uh, skip on some of the parts. But essentially, the idea was come up with a recourse that does not just flip the prediction for one model, but rather for different changes to that model. OK, quick question. Sorry, Hima. Uh would you recommend the same approach for the initial decision on whether to deny or approve an application? Yeah, that's a great question. Is so, it sort of the similar forces apply there too? Someone might not want to bank with yeah. them. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So I think this algorithm is sort of thinking about the setup where when you're training, you're training one model however you train, right? And you can make that model again robust to changes in the underlying data itself, right? Instead of the model minimizing loss functions that just map X to Y in a given data set, you can say it should also map some perturbations or increments or decrements of X to also the corresponding label, right? But you know, that is, but this approach is something that does not assume anything about what you're doing with the underlying model. You can just give me any model irrespective of how you trained it. And then I can apply this approach and give this kind of an explanation or a recourse to somebody such that even if the model changes a little bit, that will still be valid. It will still give them a positive outcome, right? So, okay, so we did a bunch of experiments with data sets capturing temporal shifts, for example, you know, data in year one and year two, uh, geospatial shifts like school education, you know, student performance data in terms of like uh, one uh, state versus the other. So we sort of took a lot of this kind of data and tried to see how effective the algorithm we proposed was, right? So the recourse generated by our framework was on an average about 74% more likely to hold when the underlying model shifts compared to some of the state of the art algorithms okay uh, so in some sense the recourses generated by a framework roar were quite valid it's like 74 percent more valid compared to those of the baselines which is a pretty good outcome right uh, so that helped us at least partly address this problem of helping the banks kind of stick to their promise once they give somebody out a recourse. Of course, there are several other reasons why this could happen, including logistical reasons and so on. But I think definitely more thought needs to be put into that, right? So the last piece was also equally intriguing where participants told us that, you know, uh, even if I fall slightly short, the bank should still give me a loan, right? So if you ask me to increase it by 5,000, I did by 4,990, I should still get a loan because I'm pretty close in the ballpark, right? Uh, so in order to address that problem, we also kind of used a similar optimization problem, which is the min-max kind of setup I briefly talked about uh, in order to uh, address this problem so that we pro provide recourses to people in such a way that even if they're implemented by being a little bit off, uh, the person would still get a loan, right? So for example, if the recourse is 5,000, if you're off by $100, you're still going to get a loan. That's how we change the algorithm in some sense to that. 
Okay. So now I'm going to talk about some user studies that we did with actually recruiters and doctors in order to understand what these feature attribution based explanations are doing. And I'll give a definition of what those are, right? So feature attribution based explanations are essentially those where you output or these methods output a bunch of feature importances. And how do the methods that output these feature importances operate? So essentially, let's go back to the picture that we initially thought, right? So for example, this could be a complex deep learning model with highly non-linear decision boundaries, okay? So this is the model's decision boundary, this class zero, let's say, and this class one. Okay, it's kind of hard to interpret these model because it's super complex, lots of nonlinear functions. So what do we do, right? Uh, so while these complex models have complex decision surfaces, if you zoom in enough, for example, if I want to explain the prediction of just this point or the features that are causing the prediction to be a certain way, then if I zoom in around this point, what we observe is essentially this, even the super complex model at a big picture level is behaving like a linear model once you zoom in around this point, right? So if you zoom in here, you sort of see that, you know, it's essentially acting like a linear model. You can draw a line and separate the two classes, right? So that intuition was actually exploited by some of the recent approaches. And what they try to do is, so the following, right? So if we want to explain the prediction or rather the features that are potentially causing this prediction, what we do is take this point and then perturb it slightly a bunch of times in order to sample points around that point, right? So essentially you sort of, take this point, add a bunch of noise to it, and then you'll get points in the neighborhood, okay? Now use the underlying complex model to predict labels for each of these points in this neighborhood that you just sampled, and now fit a weighted linear regression uh, with respect to the labels of the underlying model so that that weighted linear regression essentially tells you what is the importance of each of the features because now you have converted this problem into that of fitting a linear regression model around a point, right? So essentially all that you are doing is you have a particular model's prediction, you take the point, perturb it a bit, generate a neighborhood, on this neighborhood fit a linear regression model which tries to mimic the same predictions as that of the underlying model. Okay, now that you have a linear regression, which means like a, a bunch of points and then sort of the importances or weights associated with each of them. So you can essentially take that and, you know, call that as feature importance and say, here are the features that are playing a huge role in this prediction, right? So that's what we are talking about when we say a local explanation, uh, which is a feature attribution in this case, okay? So essentially these explanations will give us like some idea of like top K features, right? Like top four features and so on, or top five features and so on. So now using those, we wanted to understand, can we improve the accuracy of decisions using feature attribution based explanations, okay? Uh, so the first thing was a prediction problem that we looked at where we tried to ask the question, is a given patient likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer within the next two years, right? So that was a decision problem that doctors think about when they think about risks of patients to certain diseases. And then we carried out some user studies with about 78 doctors who are residents in internal medicine. And each doctor took a look at 10 patient records from historical data and made a prediction of each of them. That is, is each of these patients likely to get breast cancer within the next two years? Okay? So we randomly assigned doctors into three buckets. So the first bucket is the human only decision making bucket. Uh, and when doctors just made this prediction on their own looking at patient records, they had an accuracy of about 78%, right? And then we had the second bucket of doctors where doctors had access to the model prediction and the probability. And then together, the combined decision-making accuracy turned out to be about 82%, which is a little higher, but that's actually lower if we just look at the model's accuracy itself, which was 89%, right? Yeah. So in some sense, the doctor plus the model prediction and the model's you know, probability was not really helping a lot. In fact, it's probably better to just use the model alone. But 
When we go to the third case, where the doctor did not just have access to the model prediction, its probability, but also to the underlying top four features that the model is using according to the approach that I just described, which is we are fitting a linear model approximation. Then what we saw was the accuracy jumped up quite a bit, uh, and it was much higher than, of course, what the human-only accuracy was, but also it was higher compared to the model-only accuracy, right? So in some sense, giving some information about the features that the model might be using to a doctor can be super helpful, right? So that can actually be uh, very useful in terms of improving the overall decision-making accuracy. Um, and the second task that we did, I'm going to skip this slide. So the second task that we focused on was, can we- Sorry, Can I ask something about that study? So I don't know if you know this, but I was curious, do you think the improvement comes from doctors sort of confirming that the model works well when you're looking at those features or doctors exactly. learning that the features are, that uh, there are other features that they haven't thought about? I don't know. Right. So the improvement is coming from doctors being able to understand how much to rely on this prediction. For example, we actually saw some examples or some data instances for which the important features were things like appointment day and appointment time and zip code. And when the model is giving a prediction and these are the important features, then, you know, doctors are essentially like, that doesn't look right. You know what? I'm just going to go ahead and make my own decision, right? So in that sense, it's actually helpful uh, in the doctors deciding whether to trust the model prediction or not, or just go and make their own decision. Uh, Hema, sorry to go back uh, to one thing. Uh, you don't have to change the slides, but uh, about the, the recourses themselves, uh, yeah. do they need to be uh, pre-specified by the researcher or by the coder such that they have to follow a certain structure or they're completely discovered by the algorithm? Right. So in the algorithm itself, uh, depending on which one you pick, that choice has essentially been, been made. For example, there are some algorithms which just say, find the point that is closest to the other point you started with uh, when you compute L1 or L2 distance, right? Uh, there are other algorithms which say, use a causal graph of the underlying data and then use that in order to determine like where should this person land in order to get a positive prediction, right? So yeah, by choosing an algorithm, you have essentially made the choice of like which recourse is going to get picked. I see, thanks. Okay, so the second task that we sort of examined is can we reduce biases in decisions using these kinds of top four features that uh, I was just talking about? Uh, and how do we think about such an experiment, right? So we sort of thought about this task of screening for hiring, which is recruiters always do this, you know, that's their day-to-day -day workflow of they look at a resume and then they determine if this candidate is going to be good enough to be interviewed for this position, right? Should I pass on this resume for a further interview? So that's the question that we asked them to think about. And we did the study with about 92 recruiters and each recruiter was looking at 10 resumes and making a decision for each candidate independently. Okay, uh, so now what we did was we basically took a bunch of resumes uh, with the same content, but we essentially swapped the names on those by flipping them from like a US common female name to a US common male name, right? So we had identical copies of each resume in the data set. One had a female name, one had a male name. So that was the data set that we created. And we in fact trained a fair machine learning model, which actually is gender agnostic and looks at other attributes in this uh, resumes and then makes decisions. The model itself was fair, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. But now we are doing a similar task with three buckets of recruiters. The first bucket is essentially the recruiter making their own decision. Uh, so the recruiter looks at the CV and then determines if they want to pass on that CV for a further interview. This time, what we are measuring is the gap in selection probability. Right. Uh, so where the idea is that we are sort of computing the probability of 
a female candidate getting selected minus the prob or rather the other way the probability of the male candidate getting selected minus the probability of a female candidate getting selected okay ideally this gap should be pretty close to zero if you know there is no quote unquote gender bias in the decision making but what we observe here is this gap is kind of huge it's you know it's it's a difference in probabilities but it's already at 0 0.32 right so now we consider the second bucket or the second condition where you know there are these recruiters they have access to the model prediction and the probability of the prediction and the model itself had a selection gap that was super low which was 0 0.01 so the model is being fair in terms of how it is treating both the genders with respect to uh, sending resumes for hiring or interviews uh, but you know with the combination of this recruiter and the model predictions and probabilities led us to a gap of about 0.28 or 0.29 it's slightly lower but not much right now, the third case is we showed these top four features and essentially what started happening was the gap in the selection probability reduced a lot more. So it went from about 0 0.3 to 0.29 to 0 0.05, right? Uh, so, you know, that's essentially the you know, reduction in this biases or the gender biases that we are seeing once we start giving more information. In fact, some of our post uh, hoc interviews or like follow up interviews with these recruiters told us that almost this kind of giving these top four features as an explanation is almost acting like a behavioral nudge for them. So they're feeling like, oh, there's somebody else making this decision in an independent way. And they are able to sort of cross check on, you know, that decision and then see what factors is the other decision making looking at, maker looking at, what factors are they looking at and try and like, you know, find a middle ground, right? So especially one interesting insight we saw here was that for female candidates, the number of their their GitHub repos or the number of stars on their GitHub repos and so on uh, was, you know, getting uh, missed by human recruiters, but like algorithms were highlighting them very clearly and pointing them out to the recruiters, right? So that was helping reduce some of these biases. Okay? So with that, we are pretty much at the end of the summary of the different works that we have been doing in the past few years. I would love to chat more offline and more emails, but I just wanted to conclude with a few points. Um, so model understanding has actually re-emerged as one of the most sought after topics in machine learning in recent years. If done right, it can be helpful in probing deeper into model behavior beyond predictions and conferences. Um, and it's important to pay special attention to quantifying the correctness or accuracy of model explanations otherwise we might end up trusting and deploying models with undesirable biases all over again right so that piece needs to be nailed down very well but this field itself is rather nascent and there is a lot of scope in terms of new research for understanding the utility and improving the correctness or reliability of these kinds of explanation methods okay so with that i'm going to pause here and thank you all for your time perfect thank you so much <clears throat> Himayan, uh, thank you everyone for joining. With this, we'll conclude the uh, official part of the talk. And if people have more questions to him afterwards, please stick around and let us know. We'll uh, just post questions in Q&A or just raise your hand. We'll promote you to a panelist. Thanks, Hima. Thanks so much. I'll stop recording at this stage. <laughs>